My name is Dag Sebastian Alander. I'm a former ambassador and consul general. I belong to the government, Swedish government's committee on the, the um, Raoul Wallenberg year, the centennial. I served in the Soviet Union where I did participate in a few searches. Uh, I've written for children, for young readers, and this is my book about Raoul Wallenberg. I felt that I also wanted to give my contribution to make him him interesting for the next generation. You know, as you age, it's quite something to get the next generation or even the next next generation interested in what you say. So this is really a very rewarding task, if I may say so. We are also fortunate to have been uh, neighbors for 30 years with uh, Nina Lagergren, who is the sister of Raoul Wallenberg. So our families are good friends, and we have followed the drama in the Lagergren family about Raoul Wallenberg for all these years. Uh, my lecture, my talk, is called In Search of a Hero. Uh, it's banal, I admit, but the interesting fact is that he, uh, he Raoul Wallenberg, became a hero abroad outside Sweden long before he became a hero in his own country. It had, this is a paradox. He is, Raoul Wallenberg, the greatest humanitarian uh, ever in Swedish history. Uh, this took place during the Second World War. Sweden was a neutral country. There's an element of guilt in that. Uh, this was referred to by the provost as concerned Ireland. We have the same. Uh, but we were probably closer at hand, so our guilt is probably of a deeper quality than the Irish guilt, I would say. And that, I think, uh, accounts for the uninterest in the person of Raoul Wallenberg among many sections of the Swedish public until very recently. Therefore, I will, uh, I will deal uh, a bit about his personal life and the search for him, and I will leave his mission in Budapest more or less, to the other speakers. Uh, just a word about Hungary. Hungary uh, is, well, we all, you all know about Hungary, but you don't know that during the war, when we were surrounded by Hitler's uh, Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union, we were completely fenced in within the German uh, sphere of in influence. The Skagerrak blockade made all our trade uh, trade contact with the outer world uh, precarious and we had to look for other sources of supply and it's an interesting fact that the Wallenberg brothers Jacob and Marcus were asked by the Swedish government to share the burden of Jacob working with the German sphere of influence and Marcus working with the allied sphere of influence so Jacob had a identified Hungary as the most prosperous agricultural country within the German sphere of influence. So he started together with a friend, a company, importing eggs and geese and you name it from Hungary. A kind of job that you would think today probably would not have such a high dignity, but in those days were actually uh, quite something, uh, quite something of, of a lifeline for the Swedish for, for the Swedes. And the fact that Jacob asked through Kalman Lauer and his friend Raoul Wallenberg to do this job also has to do with the uh, power structure of the Wallenberg Bank. The Wallenberg Bank was established by A.O. Wallenberg in the uh, mid-1800s. Eight, mid eight, he, he had 12 children. So you can see that not all of them could run the bank. His oldest child Knus Agaton had no children that created even more of, of an insecure situation furthermore he became minister for foreign affairs next in line was actually Gustav Raoul's grandfather and Raoul's son was actually designated by Knut Agaton to be his heir but he died of cancer before Raoul was born and therefore, the other branch, Marcus Sr. with Marcus Jr. and Jacob, filled the va vacuum. And when Raoul became, came of age, and when he would really have a chance to go into the bank, the door was closed. And I'll tell you a little how that came about. Uh, Raoul was born 
without a father. His father had died three months before in cancer, before his birth. He was brought up by his mother and his grandmother, which did not fully, uh, what was not fully to the liking of his grandfather, Gustav Wallenberg, who felt that this was after all a Wallenberg, who was next in succession, he felt he himself had been pushed aside because he was a gregarious person, he was an outgoing person, and he was not a quiet banker. And Gustav Wallenberg took Raoul Wallenberg's education, he took charge of his education. He had ideals which were very, very different from the 30s. He micromanaged uh, Raoul Wallenberg and his, his ed studies from the embassies in Tokyo, Beijing, and Constantinople. His grandfather had the ideal. He wanted to make him a perfect gentleman and acquire an American mentality. He wanted him to study in America, but not on the East Coast, on the, in the middle of America, where people were still vibrantly vital. So Raoul went to Ann Arbor, where he was allowed to study architecture. architecture. And uh, Gustav said, you study whatever you like, this has to do with your formation as a gentleman. Later on, we'll discuss what you will do. And uh, when Raoul had acquired his education in America, the grandfather sent him to South Africa and to Palestine to practice. And there was in the letter an undercurrent of where the grandfather does not want the son to come to Sweden. He says, this country is full of traps. People will try to drag you down. Just get your education, come home as a complete man, and you'll sail into whatever profession you like to go into on that level which a Wallenberg should act on. Him on. Uh, well, Gustav, the grandfather's plan, worked out fine, apart from the fact that he died. When Raoul was ready, when he was ready to launch Raoul, grandfather died. So Raoul was actually without a protector back in Sweden and had had no contemporaries, no peers. He had gone to no Swedish uh, school of higher learning, so he had formed no group, uh, had no groupings of his own. And this, in a way, became his tragedy. And he then tried to approach the bank, uh, where he was not kindly received, and uh, the people, his cousins, second cousins in the bank, let it be known that he talked too much. He was a gregarious person. He did not have the personality of a banker. This had been told to his grandfather by his junior brother, Marcus the Senior, and that actually quickened his demise. He was so shocked by the fact that he had failed in making Raoul Wallenberg a suitable person for a, for a banking career. Uh, and here he is idle without a mission, of course, there is no lack of money, but here's a young man who's looking for a purpose in life and who takes bridge lessons. You know, then you really have a problem. And there is, there is somewhat of a tragedy of young uh, Raoul at this time. And um, my mother-in-law who met him and her group of friends said that he was not that charming. He was not a ladies' man. He's not a person that you were very happy to go out with. He talked about talk all the time, and he cared little for things that we were interested in. Or really, he cared little about sort of asking them something about life. Uh, Jacob was bombarded. His second cousin, now head of the bank, was bombarded by Raoul about, isn't there anything I can do? And he was sent on. Uh, trivial, trivial missions, and um, uh, this went on for you could, five years until Jacob told his friend Kalman Lauer in the Meropa, the company which imported foodstuff from Hungary, can you do anything for him? He can be useful. And since Kalman Lauer was a Jewish Hungarian, he had, he had uh, difficulties in traveling in wartime Europe. So Raoul was made the face, the outer face of this uh, outfit. And he did a spectacular job, but not really on the level which Grandfather Gustav thought was suitable for a gentleman with his background. Uh, luck has it, you know, life is circumstance, being there at the right moment. 
Luck has it that Meropa established itself in the same building where Jacob's friend had his company and where the American mission was. The elevator in Strandwegen 7, the posh address in Stockholm, was actually the meeting place of Ivor Olson from the War Refugee Board and the Embassy, Raoul Wallenberg, Kalman Lauer and Jacob Wallenberg's friend Sven Salin. And basically through the elevator the mission was formulated and uh, Raoul, knowing that as a Wallenberg you were always to be ready to do something for your country, uh, this was it. On top of that, the Americans liked his personality, unlike uh, the bankers. And they liked him outgoing, they liked him uh, being a person of great interest and uh, activity, and so he was engaged to go to Budapest. You should note that Raoul Wallenberg was 1 16th of Jewish heritage, but usually, usually referred to himself as half Jewish, of which he was proud. He had also been to Haifa, so he was where he met many refugees from Germany, so the problems of that part of the world were known to him. Uh, he received no instructions. This is interesting. Uh, Swedish civil servants have very little... Uh, uh, I mean, if you're the head of mission, you decide, but you always ask your ministry. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg was basically on a rather low level. He was uh, secretary of legation. Let me say about legation and all this. Prior to 1948, all small countries had legations, all big countries, great powers, had embassies. Uh, it was the United Nations with, which made them all equal, right? It's like the Senate in the US. Uh, small states, big states, all on the same level. But this was a legation and he was to become secretary of the legation. As I said, not a high position. His uh, superior was Minister Danielson, technically the ambassador, a man on his last posting. Uh, intelligent, but somewhat tired as happens. and. Um, not used to having people taking the initiative around him. The ministry presupposed that Danielson would give Ra Wallenberg his instructions. Uh, we know from letters that Danielson was overwhelmed by his collaborator and, and uh, that the way he worked was outside his imagination of what a civil servant would do. He also had the independence of being under American instruction. Those were very general. Raoul Wallenberg realized that he had a problem here, so he has actually written, there's a note from the ministry where he actually says, I hereby request or require that I will not be persecuted for any of the bribes that I know I have to give in order to achieve anything in Budapest under these conditions. You know, this is shocking. Here you have a Swedish government official who's saying, I'm going to bribe. Uh, and there's absolutely no reply to this request. There's not even a sign. It's typical that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs did not even establish a dossier about Raoul Wallenberg. You did that for all personnel, they just feel this guy is outside our scope. You know, you know, just let him go and we'll pay the salary, but he will, his operations are financed by the Americans. Uh, Within weeks, Raoul Wallenberg's position, within weeks in Budapest, his position changed dramatically. Here was a young collaborator who was basically supposed to report to the War Refugee Board about the situation and take any appropriate action. You hear the word, any appropriate action, means basically in diplomatic term, nothing. But here's a young man who meets reality, who sees all these people who are persecuted. And the first thing he does is to ask them, you know, when he sees them, he realizes, I must help them. Can you drive? Yes, he can drive. You'll be my driver. And then he sort of gradually employed a staff of up to 300 Jews who were uh, Hungarian Jews who were allowed to work with him without any stars or anything under his authority. He became the chief officer and in many ways the head of mission. To set, I would say that he broke all the rules, the diplomatic rules of, uh, of protocol and praxis, and uh, that is what made his role so dramatic. 
diplomats do not behave as Raoul Wallenberg did, I can assure you that. And that is one reason that I think the hero status is actually relevant. He can be accorded that. Uh, his trump card was, as I said, money. He was given money through Switzerland by the War Refugee Board. He developed a protective passport uh, in such a way that he would uh, that he would be respected by German and uh, Hungarian authorities. He was so quick at doing it that he got the coat of arm upside down. I don't know if you look at the protective passport, there's one star and two stars. It should be two stars and one star. But he was a young man and an amateur at this, but there was no, he did not lack any will of getting things done. His colleagues, the minister I would say was very compliant. Not all his colleagues were. Herr Anger is the exception, but there were others who are not so often named because they complained. How could this be going on at the Swedish diplomatic missions? How can we protect real Swedish interests if he goes on like that? And later, Raoul Wallenberg and his Jews have taken over the uh, mission. Don't forget, you have a bureaucracy, you have people who work by the book, and in comes this uh, twister, it's a whirlwind, and, and uh, the, the atmosphere becomes very, very different. I, I think it must have been fascinating, but I think it probably was very difficult for those assistants and uh, collaborators who were not on par with him to, to, uh, to, uh, to live with him on a daily basis. Difficulties triggered Raoul Wallenberg. He developed administrative skills that he had no idea he had. His personality came to great use. He had a very compelling personality. I said he was gregarious, he loved imitating people, and he was perfect in German. So he, he developed the same kind of body, body language and same kind of using the German language as the Germans and the Hungarians themselves. And he put himself in a position of authority and he would order them about in a way that their superiors would order them about. He would never moralize. This is very interesting. Raoul Wallenberg, really, I'll never moralize. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to tell you the truth. You're losing this war. You will be, for any war crimes you do, you'll be persecuted. You help me, I'll testify. I'll help me, you, I'll testify for you. And if that didn't work, he had the money in his pockets. And that was very compelling uh, and worked until the coup in mid-October when suddenly all these protective passports turned out to be less protective than hitherto thought, because suddenly you had the arrow cross, the fascists in power, and many of those were street hooligans who would attack <coughs> Jews despite the fact that they had protective passports. So this is where the uh, Swedish houses come in. Uh, prominent wealthy Hungarians would uh, donate or their the use of their houses for the time being, so that Raoul Wallenberg could put the, the, uh, his um, protected Jews in those buildings. Uh, with the new fascist government in Budapest, he had three, he had four cards to play. The new regime wanted recognition. Recognition was withheld by all the neutral states, but was dangled in front of them as you know something that could actually be, be uh, achieved if they complied. There was threat of war crimes for Hungarians and Germans. There was offer of payments, and there was also saying, "Look, can you hear the bomb? The front, the Russians are coming." So there were various ways of working it with this. <coughs> Most missions left Budapest, uh, very few stayed. The Swedish missions stayed, all of them, because had they left, the uh, Hungarian Jews under Swedish protection would have no more protection. To add to this, the Swedish Red Cross had been, uh, had been um, their buildings had been attacked and they had been outlawed. Uh, so. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg had quite a, a group of people to, um, to cater for. And don't forget, cater for. He had to provide 
these people, 20, 25,000 people, with food on a daily basis. He established hospitals. He had all kinds of systems of making this work. And I think this is another part of the greatness of Rod Wallenberg. Most of us, uh, in any bureaucratic field, this is not the kind of work we are good at. Uh, of getting, this is hands-on. This is really, how do, how do you get someone to sell something to you now? And how do you stack it away? And how do you protect it from not being looted? I mean, all that is a fantastic achievement by someone who had no uh, background in this field. Uh, how, why did, how could, I mean, the Germans saw what went on. And, um, you know, you wonder why they accepted this. Well, Sweden was uh, representing Germany in uh, 11 states. Uh, Himmler wanted a channel open to the West. There are many reasons why the Germans felt that if they accepted these protected passports, they could, uh, they could deal with the rest of the Jews in Germany. This is, must be one of the reasons why they were relatively tolerated. Don't forget, Eichmann did not tolerate this. He, he was wildly against it. But he was not on such a high level. You had other Germans, the ambassador and the commander and so on, and they knew exactly they were looking towards the future as well and realized we have to be careful here. And I think that plays a great role. I'm glad to say that grandfather Gustav's education was borne out by events. Uh, he developed an unknown potential. So all of you who are parents, don't despair if your kids <laughs> want to do strange things. Support them, because this is one reason why we get interesting different individuals who suddenly climb a race to the occasion and can do things of this kind. The tragedy with Ra about Raoul Wallenberg, his personality, his education, his personal lavishness did not work with the Russians. I think that is a fact that we tend to forget. Also, the Swedes were extremely naive. We, uh, the Swedish legation in Budapest, represented the Soviet Union diplomatically. We thought that once the Russians came in, we would be lavishly thanked for our, our generous support of uh, the Soviet Union. And, and uh, this did not happen, of course. Raoul, Wallen Raoul Wallenberg also wanted to meet Marshal Malinowski, he wanted to meet the new Hungarian government in Debrecen. Secretary of uh, Legation wanting to meet the Marshal, what is going on here? Well, he wanted to explain his mission. Was it his role to explain his mission? You wonder. Marshal Malinowski was rather upset at what he saw in Budapest. The city was full of flags, Swedish, Swiss flags and the Vatican flags everywhere and he asked is there a carnival going on he was after all taking Budapest by storm and you have these flags so the Russians were very wary what is going on here and um, I think the Swedish naiveness was soon brought to an end when the Russians plundered the Swedish mission and uh, and the Swedish personnel were taken uh, prisoners I must add here that the Swedish mission was on the Buddha side. The Buddha side fell in uh, February, whereas Raoul Wallenberg consciously uh, wanted to be on the pest side, as far east as possible on the pest side, to reach the Russians as soon as possible, to be able to introduce himself and his mission. On the 15th, he met Russians on a mid-level, Lieutenant Colonel, on the 17th, he declared he was going to see Marshal Malinowski, but he said to his collaborators, I don't know if I'm going as a guest or a prisoner. And on the 19th of uh, <clears throat> January, he was arrested by orders of Stalin. We know it's Stalin, but it was signed by Bulganin, future Soviet leader. And on the 25th, he was sent by railway coach to Moscow. What we know about his life uh, in prison, we have from uh, witnesses mainly German prisoners of war, but also Italian prisoners of war. He was arrested as a prisoner of war. Now, isn't that something for a diplomat from a neutral state? It contravenes all the rules of international diplomacy, and really, you wonder why this happened. I think uh, 
his, as I said, the, the self-assurance with which he appeared, which worked on the fascists, did not work so well with the communists who were extremely suspicious of anyone. A lot of money was found on him, of course. He paid his way to get things done. Uh, they knew he came from the, from the prominent banking family. We know you're a prominent capitalist, they told him when they interrogated him. We think you are a spy. When he declared that he was saving Jews, they just laughed. Would anyone in his right mind do that, they, they asked. Uh, they, had no, they, they felt this guy, is, this is fishy. And he also had this idea so, of how Hungary would be restructured after the war, how, how they would help the Jews. And also this was something they would had no wish to hear anything about. Uh, the Soviet Union arrested two Swiss diplomats who were exchanged subsequently with two uh, Soviet citizens. And um, we know that the Soviets did uh, try to make a few approaches towards the foreign ministry to see how we responded. And unfortunately, our response was the following. And don't forget that Vice Minister, Foreign Minister Dekan also said, Raoul Wallenberg is under our protection. And the Russian minister Kolontai in Stockholm said, Raoul Wallenberg is under our protection. But now we were no longer surrounded by Hitler's Germany. We were surrounded by Stalin's Soviet Union. So when the other part of the mission, the Buddha group, came to, through Moscow to go home, they were warned at the station by Ambassador Söderblom, the Swedish ambassador, not a single bad word about the Russians. Don't you say that. So when they came home and, 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 uh, and described their life in Budapest, and, and not, they, they described what, had went, what went on, and suddenly they said, and the Russians came, now we're here. It's a famous statement in Per Anger's book, the Russians took Budapest and now we're here. No more, nothing else about the Russians. Uh, also, other members of the mission, you'll remember that I said that not all were so happy about Raoul Wallenberg's activities. They started complaining to the Swedish mission. There was chaos at the mission. Raoul Wallenberg is damaging Swedish interests. The Jews took over, you can imagine. So there was a sort of, there was a un, unease around um, the mission in Budapest. Also, Stalin changed his personnel at the Swedish mission. Madame Kollontai had been 15 years in Stockholm. She was a good friend of Jacob and Marcus Wallenberg. Uh, she met them on a regular basis. This did not interest Stalin. He wanted to cut that tie immediately. And suddenly, it was, no, it was, we were told, Raoul Wallenberg is unknown to us. Uh, we know that Raoul Wallenberg were, was inter interrogated three times. We know that he tried to get in contact with the Swedish mission. He wanted to have a trial. He got the reply, you're a spy, you will never be tried. And he was also told, no one cares about you. The this, this, this Swedish embassy in Moscow has not even made one inquiry about you. Uh, and Ambassador Söderblom was convinced that Raoul was dead. And this is what he said, of course, in the mayhem in Budapest, many things could have happened. He's probably dead or uh, he might have died in a car accident. Söderblom was granted an interview with Stalin. This is very unique. Most diplomats were not granted interviews with Stalin. He went up and uh, Stalin said, well, and Söderblom brought up the subject that Raoul Wallenberg said, we just want to know where he died. Okay? And Stalin looked at him somewhat surprised and said, uh, haven't we been in contact with you? Mm -hmm. Now I know he's dead, said Söderblom. And he put the words into Stalin's mouth. And the interview was concluded within five minutes. We now know that Stalin had set aside an hour to discuss with the Swedish ambassador. And what he wanted to discuss was exchange of various Soviet personalities in Sweden that he wanted to lay his hands on. Uh, 
the new Swedish foreign minister, when this was brought to his attention by outsiders, said, we do not trade in humans. So you can say the moment was lost and the Russian Secret Service suddenly sat with a Swedish diplomat on hand of no use. We uh, believe from what we know of, of the so, uh, Russian inquiry that the uh, Russian uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs was not aware of this. They were not aware of his arrest and that he was in the country for quite some time. Uh, it took until February 1947 when um, Molotov asked, we hear from the Swedes all the time about Wallenberg. What can you tell us? He asks Abakumov. Abakumov uh, sends a letter to Molotov, it's also there, suggesting a liquidatia of this problem. Liquidatia means you can end the problem in either bureaucratically or you can kill someone. And it was discussed at that time, Sudoplatov has it in his memoirs, the only way to let a spy go is either to set him free as an agent or kill him. And by now we know that most probably he was killed on the 17th of July, 1947. But we are not satisfied with the explanations we have received. Uh, Gromyko said in 1957, yes, we believe he, was, he died of a heart attack. Now, we know that in the Lefortova at that time was a doctor who killed off patients with uh, poison and that they all got death certificates of um, heart failure of various kinds. Now, uh, and finally in 1991, Nina and Guy, uh, his half-brother, on a visit to Russia, suddenly without any comments, got a big box on the table it contained all Raoul Wallenberg's private items, his passport, his diary, uh, his money, a ring, and various things, letters and things that he had kept there. And they refused to comment, and the family took the box, uh, but there has been no more explanation of this, and we are not happy with it. Uh, for years, the Swedish government looked for witnesses, you know, they came at various times. You had the Italian prisoners of war coming after Stalin's death. You had the German prisoners of war coming in 55, 56. And there was always someone with something to say about Wallenberg. But towards the end of the 70s, interest petered out. Um, there was nothing new. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg's parents actually uh, committed suicide, they were old and they could not stand living without having, without being able to act for their son. And uh, it's only through circumstances that his fate was brought to world attention. Uh, as you remember, the Kissinger era under Nixon and also Ford was a policy, a real politic, no morals in foreign policy, you deal with anyone. And ultimately, you could say the American voter was disgusted with this and voted in Jimmy Carter and his human rights uh, lobby. And we have mentioned Ronald Reagan here and praised him, but I think Jimmy Carter is due a lot of praise for bringing this issue up. As always, life is full of paradoxes. What brought this to the American uh, attention of the American public was another fake witness, another person, another imposter who traveled the world saying he had, he had met Raoul Wallenberg. But he played a useful role in awakening American opinion. And once Raoul Wallenberg became an American honorary citizen, the full, uh, full throttle was given to trying to find him. He was also in the Cold War. You could say the ideal hero. He fought Nazism and he was killed, uh, he was detained but by the communists. So um, in many ways, this was the ideal citizen. I think you could say that he is a hero in many ways. I would conclude with saying that. I would like to, before I finish on this subject, uh, say that there's another hero who, who is somewhat unsung, and that's Karl Lutz at the Swiss mission. 
sometimes when I talk in schools about my book, about Raoul Wallenberg, they want to know, and had he come home, would he have been treated like a hero? I don't think so. I think bureaucracy is very good at diminishing people and at, 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 uh, at um, hurting them when they, it comes to people with a lot of fantasy, with a lot of um, creative power. Karl Lutz went back to Switzerland to the home base foreign ministry in Bern. What do you think happened? He was asked by the administrative bureau, how about the uh, finances of the mission? You haven't signed any of these since the spring of 1944. You know the money should be counted and you should sign and the head of the mission should sign as well. Where is it? You're the one responsible. Well, he tried to say, you know, we had this and we had these protective houses and so on. But you didn't do this. You admit this. Yeah, I admit it. And this went on in all the various divisions of the foreign ministry until they decided to take him out of service for misdemeanor. So Karl Lutz was actually sacked, uh, not treated as a hero, and he spent 10 years uh, in the wilderness, a very unhappy man. I, he became ill and, uh, yeah, uh, as you can imagine. Suddenly, it was brought to the Swiss government's attention. Luckily, and a, uh, uh, and a commission was established who looked into his case, and he was re-established, his, his, re his honor was given back to him, but that was a very slow process which actually meant, uh, uh, contributed greatly to his death. So I'm saying to you, it's not easy to be a hero. Uh, it's always a question of being there. Well, basically this is what I have to say on this issue. Uh, thank you so much. i just say a few words since I worked in New York about the monuments. It was my privilege to work on the monument, which is now outside the UN in New York. And unlike our European countries, where everything gets bogged down. Once I had presented this uh, proposal to the Mayor's Commission for Parks and Recreations, Mr. Henry Stern, another Wallenberg-type person, completely unbureaucratic and considered slightly weird by, by uh, the diplomatic community, he took my hand and said, dog, let's make this happen. And you know, I love it. <laughs>